Thank you, Frank and Brother Savage. Amen. And good evening to the rest of you that I did not hear. Amen. Good evening, everybody. It is a beautiful day out there. Thank you. See how much more alive it is when there's like a two-way interaction here? Uh, what a great day. It has been hot the last three days. Oh, my. I, I have... I have thought more than once about resigning as pastor here and moving to Wyoming, where on these types of days I can be up in the Bighorn Mountains and it's 60 degrees, the snow-capped mountains, but the Lord has not allowed me to do that yet, so I will gr be grudgingly or grudgingly teach tonight, but just let you know it's hot out there, and hopefully we'll be getting a break in the weather soon. Amen. Remember uh, Sister Jane? Uh, we were up there, Jess and I went up to the the hospital today to talk with her she did get moved out of the room that she was in she's in a different room for me and so that since the last time I was there and uh, we were able to be there for a good time and talk with her and stuff like that I just can't imagine being in a, a hospital room for that amount of time and uh, so just keep her in prayer and at this point in time I'm not even sure everything that needs to happen here but you know I'm praying that she will be able to um be placed into a, a home that will be able to take good care of her and that people can come in and out and visit and it's not just a hospital room and so just remember her in prayer also brother and sister wise keep them in prayer we went over there and was visiting with them for a while and you know um it, it breaks my heart you know we're as we're talking to them tears are in my eye my eyes and, and jess's eyes as uh, a man that has been married for 54 years 11 of those years outside of church and the rest of the year, those years in church, you know, has to watch the, um, his wife in the condition that she is. She's still okay. Um, she's not in any pain, any of that stuff, but she is um, uh, has been sent home, and she she knows. And so um, she loves you guys. They both thank you for all the food and the kindness and the visitations and the calls, and they are very thankful for that. We're praying, and we will until the last that God can turn this around. We've seen him do this kind of stuff before if he chooses, but then at some point in time, you feel like you're praying selfish prayers. Um, you know, we want we want somebody to remain here with us while they're in suffering and they're in pain rather than going on to their reward. And so let's just lift them up in prayer. Please remember them. I want you to look over here to my left, and uh, I don't know if you noticed that when you came in, but uh, the, the red indicator has gone up. And so it's I, that's right. It has gone up and I want you to take some take close inventory. Jess had updated it. I didn't know, it, but I updated it even a little bit more. This is the hundred thousand mark and we are above that. I was talking with Mark, the banker, and he said since March, you guys have paid fifty two thousand five hundred dollars on your loan. So. That's a little over, a little over five and a half months or a little over five months this church has, has uh, focused and we have paid $52,000 off of our mortgage. He said what, that ha what happens now is because of all the interest that we have paid down, generally with a, a loan fixed year over 30 years, your first, just say 10 years, you're only paying just say $300 towards the actual uh, loan amount and then the rest of that out of the 1100 goes to interest and then that kind of changes over the course but we have now made it to where every month we're paying $725 of our regular uh, loan amount right to the principal of the loan and so we're, we're we're doing some damage amen and and I'm just believing that that somehow in God's way and God's time that by the time two year mark the two year mark is up, what would that be, uh, March 2024, that, that we will have this thing nailed down. As far as the puzzle, I'm sorry, Sister Coons is working diligently, but I am still failing at putting that thing together. It just requires so much time, and so we will get that puzzle, I promise you, but I want you to focus on that. We are doing it. Amen. We are doing it. First Peter 1.15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Thayer's definition of that word conversation is manner of life. It's your conduct, the way you live, the way you behave yourself. It's the way you essentially represent Christ to this world. So it's your lifestyle. Peter is saying in everything you do, you are to live like Christ. You are to pursue holiness in all manner of lifestyle. 
Uh, for the last three weeks, I have been talking about guarding your eyes, especially how it pertains to entertainment via uh, video games, videos, DV- DVDs, VHSs, books, magazine, romance novels, anything that you do for entertainment that enters into the eye gate. And we have been talking about that. And, and my goal is this. I could probably condense all of this to one week, but, you know, I've always been taught this, that repetition is the best teacher. You want to get muscle memory, uh, just do something over and over and over again. Like I can get on the drum set and I can play a five-stroke roll. I'd have to think about it. Let me think about it. Okay, so it goes like this. Right, left, left, right, right, left. Sister Wright's not in here, is she? Right, left, left, right, right, left, and then you start over with your right. So, I don't even think about what I'm doing. It's natural. It's called muscle memory. So, the more, but you know what, when I first started doing that, it looked like this. entire drum set now I can get on there and I can do it on the hi-hat the snare and the bass and I can just do it why because repetition is the best teacher my teacher in Bible school Galen Thompson he said if I you haven't got it then I haven't taught it if if I as the teacher cannot communicate very thoroughly what I'm trying to communicate then then I'm not communicating I'm not teaching effectively but if I can in 25 weeks, if I can read First Peter 1.15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And as I start to read this, you're quoting it without even looking at your Bible. Then we're getting somewhere because the more you learn how to do something, the more you repeat something, the more you learn it, the easier you learn it. And so for three weeks, we have been talking about guarding your eyes uh, and some of the principles, and I'm not going to rehash everything. Some of the principles that I've been trying to in, uh, relay to you is this, that I cannot help what the world does out there. OK, I can't help how people dress. Um, we we were up at the, the creek and we were swimming, all of us kids, and, and we look like Pentecostals up there. I have I have swish pants on. I have a long shirt on. I'm, I got socks on my feet. We're in the creek, and it's a big hole. And all of our kids, they're dressed up. They got their they got their full tops on. They got dresses on with their their skirts on, and and all of us are clothed. We look like we're hanging out at church. And then, you know, there was some some other other people that came down. Some other little kids that were not like us. Okay, they were not dressed like us. They they had a little bit less clothing on than what we had. Then we had another group come through and uh, then we had some college kids come through and and they were there was all different variety of people that came through and guess what we were the only ones that looked like we were (laughs) in our street clothes okay but here's the scoop I can't help what they do out there I'm not going to pull out my Bible and try to convict somebody of an apostolic lifestyle when they don't even have the Holy Ghost hello I'm I'm not I, I can't help what they do out there but I can most definitely help what I allow to come into my home. I allow to come across my TV. I allow to be read or ingested into my, my, my spirit via the eye gate. Jesus said if your eyes are, are uh, light or single or light, th- then your whole body is full of light. In other words, if your eyes are always l- letting goodness come in, godliness come in, virtue come in, and you're letting good things go into your eyes, then the rest of you is going to follow. But if your eyes be darkened or if your eyes be unclear, then the rest of your body is going to be muddied. The rest of your body is going to, uh, it, uh, hopefully I'm communicating that right, it's going to be dirty. What you're s- in other words, the, the, the importance is, is what you allow to come into your eye gate becomes who you are. It affects who you are. And so if you're a Christian trying to live a godly life and, and you're a lady and you want to live a life of holiness and please God uh, even even outwardly, then I would suggest get rid of the Cosmopolitan magazines. I would suggest 
Stop trying to follow what Hollywood is doing. I would suggest get off of that nonsense. Stop trying to follow the latest worldly trends of what's what's in and what's out. And if you're a man trying to live godly, stop looking at men's fitness magazines all the time. Stop ingesting the manly, worldly man spirit into your own heart because guess what? That's what you're going to become. What you eat is what you become. If you eat trash, then you're going to feel like trash. If you eat healthy, then you're going to be healthy. And so it's talking about uh, what we're allowing to enter into our mind via the eye gate, and we have the right to choose. We we choose the battlements. You remember the lesson on battlements. The battlements were in the Old Testament Deuteronomy. He said when you build a house, you construct a house, and you are to put a, a knee wall or a fence or a battlement along the edge because you, what you don't want is a kid to go up to your top roof and then fall off and somebody die. What you don't want is a bunch of people to be gathered up on the upper roof having fellowship and a, a person just walking not even paying attention and he falls off your roof and he dies and his blood will be on your hand. And so the Bible says put up battlements, put up fences. And so we apply that spiritually in our home. The, the any area that we see danger spiritual danger creeping into our home, we have the right, we have the ability to say, I don't want that TV show in my home. I don't want that author into my home. I don't want that nonsense into my home. I'm not going to put up with it. Why? Because I don't want my children to be affected by the worldly spirits that we're allowing to come into my home, my haven, my safe place via such and such. And so um, we, we had talked a little bit and I gave my personal guidelines of of how we have set battlements, and I have said that I don't watch anything PG-13 or above. I don't even consider it. And now in the day and the era that we live in, it's not just a rating that I'm, I'm filtering. It's what's being pushed through even G-rated movies and PG movies. Is it homosexual agendas being pushed through there? And I don't know exactly what it is. It's called, um, it's, it slips to the top of my mind, but there are, there are, uh, Jess, help me out. There are you can get online. It's a it's a website you can get on, and basically it tells you what what's all in the film. What am I? Uh, uh, that don't sound familiar. Um, but basically, it tells you from a Christian perspective what is in this. And there's a a newly released Disney movie, um, Chasing Red, or something like that. And and in it, it has raised a lot of concerns. Of course, anything Disney's putting out nowadays raises a lot of concerns. And Basically, in that video, it's defiance against parents, and there's other agendas that are being pushed. And so there's websites that we can get on, and I think you – did you raise your hand? You Yeah, and so that's a case in point of what I'm trying to say. And so um, what uh, those that are on, online, you won't see it, but what Frank was saying is there's two cartoons uh, that have been coming out, and I'm pretty sure both of them are Disney-released. Both of them Disney. The whole thing about Disney, the uprising about Disney right now, is they're making it a goal to introduce the transgender and the homosexual agenda into every movie. Okay, if that's the case, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Disney is gone, Okay. Matter of fact, uh, it was at Man Up Adventure that Nathan Thompson was just telling the men. He was saying, "Listen, I, I, one guy was going to go to Disney World, and you do you. I'm not. I'm not micromanaging." But he's, you know, Nathan was like, "Man, it's just full of homosexuality and transgender." And, and the pastor's like, "Ah, whatever. And everybody wants to go to Disney. Well, they went to Disney. He took his family to Disney. He came back and basically apologized. Said, "You're right. There was men with men, and there was women with women, and there was transgender all over the place down there. You know, if that is the motive, then I'm done. I'm checked out. I'm not supporting that stuff. And so here's the scoop. You have to understand that the 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 I have to." put battlements up for my children. I have to put battlements. There's some things I'm not going to tolerate, you know, and what used to be just a, 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 a simple cartoon. It's now you got 
companies like Disney trying to infiltrate into our children what is deemed by popular culture acceptable. And when you have them coming out and saying what they're going to do, we got some problems with that. I don't want that into my children's mind. I don't want them to think that. They already got to deal with that stuff at public. You know, and so why, why would I introduce that into my home, my haven, a spiritual safe place? So what, the, what this isn't, though, and, and kudos to you, Frank, for looking into this kind of stuff. What, what this isn't is me now trying to walk around with a ruler and, and size up Michelle and where Michelle's at in life or Anita and where Anita's. I'm not casting judgment, okay? Every one of us parents will give an account, and we're, every one of us parents are, are going to look back one day and say, I probably should have did this better. I, I wish I wouldn't have been like this, or I, I could have done this, okay? I'm not trying to cast judgment. I'm trying to lay out spiritual scriptural battlements, real life practical application of what holiness looks like in 2022. And so again, you can't help it for anybody that tries to say, well, my kids see it out there in the world. Well, that's great. Okay. We all face that. We all fight, fight with that, but you don't have to allow that to be accepted and laughed about and celebrated in your own home. Either it's sinful or it's not. Either it turns your stomach because it's against creation of God and, and it's against the natural male and the female, or it doesn't. We don't need to celebrate that by entertaining ourselves with it. And so, again, this is not anybody. Hear me. If, if you hear, let's just throw this out there. Brother Nevis, man, he loves the Rise of the Minions. OK, and we hear Brother Nevis and Sister Nevis got popcorn and they watched Rise of the Minions. You're not judging. You understand. I told you I have friends. I have people that I love that, that they don't they watch shows that I will never allow to come into my home. OK, I don't judge them. I, I'm not trying to trying to figure out who's who's, you know, running the strictest standard in life. You need to pray about things like this. That's why I refuse to micromanage anybody's holiness because, you know, what? I could preach something. I could pound this pulpit and I could say this is what you've got to do. And you could do it because I say you have to do it. And guess what? When the time comes and it's not in your heart, it will fail you. But if you will get a hold of these holiness principles and you will start praying, you will start asking God, God, I want to please you. Is this pleasing to you? And you start developing your own relationship. And now God is guiding you. Guess what? That's going to stick with you. Because when God convicts you of something, you know it. I can convict you of something. And if you do it for me, guess what? Another man can come along and unconvict you. But if God convicts you, that's something between you and God. That's something precious in your life. That's a, an area that you hang on to, that you fight for. So these are not to judge. I am not judging anybody. And you, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you know, if I hear somebody say, oh, I saw this or I did that, I'm not judging you. But you know the spiritual repercussions. Okay, you now know three weeks of teaching. And so this is up to you to apply. So I've stated this several times that that. Our convictions, our holiness convictions should not be governed by our taste or our preferences, but rather they should be governed, governed by God's taste and God's preferences. I've heard this. Well, I just don't want to see nudity. Why? Because when so-and-so sees nudity, it spirals their mind off into a, a downhill slope. But they're okay with gory violence. Okay, well, that, that doesn't make sense because the same God that wants us to dress properly and holy is the same God that Psalms 11 one says he hates them that do violence. John says do violence to no man. So so we have to make sure that it's not us, because what happens when when, you know, you have somebody that says, well, I don't mind seeing nudity. I don't care. I'm not going around lusting after nudity, but I don't want to see violence. How does that work? So what I'm saying is this, that that your preference and your standard is not where we strive for. It's God's preference. It's what what God's what God thinks of these issues. So if we just simply ask the right questions and not the wrong questions, we will get the right results and not the wrong results. The right questions sound a lot like this. Does it please Jesus? The right questions sound like this. Does it edify my walk with God? This idea of, and I touched on this, I think it was the first two or three lessons, this idea of asking the questions, what can I do and still make it to heaven? How much world can I partake in but yet still make heaven my home? You're asking the wrong questions. 
When God has a spiritual destiny and a spiritual purpose for every one of us, a calling that God's spirit fills us, and now we got a, a spiritual purpose, when we're asked in the questions, how much worldliness can I partake in and yet still make it to heaven, you've missed the entire point. You're missing the point. It's not how much can I do and still make it to heaven. It's does it please God, and if it doesn't edify me, and if it doesn't edify my godly purpose, then I will, don't want nothing to do with it. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. In other words, he's saying this just because I can do something and get away with it doesn't mean I should. An athlete, a sprinter, marathon runner could have a soda if they wanted. But guess what? They have an end goal in mind. And they realized that one soda could literally be the difference between them passing this finish line a millisecond before their competitors. And so uh, uh, they could go out and eat candy bars. They could go out and eat trash food. But guess what? They choose not to. Why? Because of their higher purpose and their higher calling. Because they have, a, they have an end goal in mind. They have a, an idea of, of where they're trying to get to. And when Christians don't understand that there's a calling ahead of them and an end goal in mind, a vision, without vision, people perish. Without your godly vision, we just live life here or there. We just live life in the mundane. We have nothing that restrains us and keeps us focused on the goal. So he goes on and says this uh, to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And here it is. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a good soldier. Again, no man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. And so what it's saying is this, a man that's called of God, a woman that's called of God, you're not going to get sucked up into a bunch of worldly nonsense. You're going you're gonna to push off worldliness. You're going to push off the things and the ideals and the ideas of this world. Why? Because you're in pursuit of a heavenly calling. And so 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful unto me, not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And this it's like this in the New International Version. I have a right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have a right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so what this is talking about is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because the athlete can have a candy bar doesn't mean he should, especially if he wants to be a winner and, and beat his competitors. And so do you understand what I'm saying? We have to get beyond this, this question mark. Is it a sin? Just because it's not a sin does not mean it can't entangle you and slow you down to where God is calling you and leading you to be. That's why Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin, the things that hold us back. Men's fitness is not a sin. It teaches you how to eat healthy. It teaches you how to do proper exercises. exercises. But guess what? It also puts into a person a spirit of pride if they're not careful. And so for me personally, guess what? Men's fitness is out. Not that it's a sin, but, but because it trapped me, it weighed me down. It caused stumbling blocks before me. It's like here I am trying to live, live a wholesome, godly life and get this natural brute anger out of me that I had when I was a lot younger and dumber. And, and now I'm trying to kill that monster, but I'm feeding that monster and I'm trying to live for God, but yet feed this monster and kill the monster at the same time. It's like here, pride, I want you dead. And you take a sword and you slice at it. But then on the next hand, you feed it cookies and yogurt. It's like we're throwing mixed signals here. What do I want? What is really important in my life? What is really valuable to me? That's the question. So you understand what I'm saying? When you have a spiritual calling and God has put his spirit inside of you, you're not living like everybody else lives. You, if you are, you don't, you don't understand your godly purpose. You don't have a proper vision for your life. And so one last re recap again. We don't. We don't ask the wrong questions. The question that you need to ask in all your entertainment is, is this wholesome entertainment? I went miniature golfing with my family. Jamie and his family was there. That was wholesome entertainment, okay? My, my kids love Little House on the Prairie. To me, that is very wholesome entertainment. So 
you you got to be the judge. Fathers in this place, that's Frank, that's Jeremy, Brother Nevis, that's um, Brother Savage. Of course, your children are gone, but Tyler, the rest of us younger men, um, we have to. We are the leaders of our home. We have to set the spiritual tone. What comes in under your watch, you will be held accountable for. Okay, and I would like to think that every wife here is on board. Michelle loves Jeremy so much; she's on board with everything. Crystal loves Frank; they're on board. Tyler and Tanya. They're on board with each other. Let me say this, men. Even if there's a disagreement in the spouses, you're the leader. So if you tuck tail and you cower and you don't lead that home, regardless, you can't blame your wife. You're the leader. You're the one that will give an account. You're the one that sets the barricades and the battlements in your home. I say this as men. Let's make sure that we're doing the best we can to protect our wife, to pe- protect our children, and to make our home the best safe place that we can. Amen. That's good teaching, men. Preach it, Pastor. Holiness is not a ruler in any of our hands to judge anybody by. So I want to I want to slip from talking about guarding our eyes, and I want to talk about entertainment in regards to music. All the principles of entertainment are the same. They're pretty much interchangeable. When it comes to the eyes, the Bible has a lot to say about the eyes. But the Bible also instructs us and informs us in all manner of conversation and all manner of lifestyle and everything we do, we are to pursue holiness. And that includes what we are listening to podcast, audio books. These are amazing tools for learning and for information. However, the content of what we are listening to matters because again, you are what you eat. I had a, a, a pastor friend of mine. Uh, he was talking to me and he said, you know, when I first started listening to this hunting show, it, it was whatever. It was it was great. It was positive. You know, he personally put up with a, a, a few nonsensical things and ignored that. And and then later on, he said, I never realized it. But over the course of the years of listening to this hunting podcast, how much this person started pushing this this like evolution theory and this all the, the laws that are going out with global warming and this agenda that came over and and this this natural progression of things. And and he's not a godly man. The hunter isn't. And so the pastor is the hunter isn't. And so the hunter's not. And so he realized he's like, man, maybe it, it like started to affect with my thinking. Just constant, a constant feed of these ideas that are against the word of God. The hunting, there's no problem with that. But constant, the constant uh, terminology of of a, an old earth and decades and millions of millennials ago and this and that and how animals are evolving. And it's just that constant feed. I think we need to protect ourselves from that. So, again, if you intake trash, you'll become trash. Music has been around for a long time. Music was created in heaven by God as an element of worship. And throughout the Bible, we can see music being used in various capacities, such as worship to God, festive music. Uh, when the prodigal son came home, um, they, they were in celebration. There was music and there was happiness. Um, there was worship also to, to devils. There was worship also to false gods and Moloch with the beating of the drums. They would lay, they would lay babies on Moloch's arms that were heated up, and basically they would sear and burn these babies alive, and the drums would be beaten so that it covered up the, the scream and the cry of this basically offering up children to this false god. And so when you just go through the Bible, you can see that music has a variety of applications. And I think we all can agree on this, that anything that God has created, the devil will take and try to make a counterfeit. God created music to worship him, and so now we see this, that the devil has also used music and has used that to bring worship to himself through the glorification of sin, the glorification of sinful lifestyles. Music in and and of itself is not bad, just like any other entertainment via the eye gate, but the world has taken music down the slippery slopes of sin. Remember when I said the last two weeks that, that entertainment is not bad, 
but entertainment left into the hands of fallen nature or sin, sinful people, people that aren't spirit filled, it will always lead and gravitate towards sin, any type of entertainment. And so the same is true with music. Through the avenue of music, we can listen to words that then paint a visual picture in our mind. And that visual entertainment or that visual picture is now processing through our minds and not on a screen, but yet it's still implanted here all the same because it came through our ears. I, I laugh. There's a song. Um, it's by Slipknot, which is a heavy, heavy metal ba- band. It's, um, it's a band that they're definitely not wholesome. They're definitely not godly. They dress up with masks and things like that. And when I first... I mean, back in the day, uh, you know, when I was in high school, there was three years where I listened to whatever I wanted to listen to. And, you know, my preferred, what do they call it, genre is metal, heavy metal, rock and roll. The one that, like, makes me want to rip my hair out is country music. It's like, and, and somebody's like, why? That's so crazy. It's like, because both of them end in the same place. The one just takes you to hell immediately. The other one, the other one like drags you along this whole central thing and this whole central lifestyle and this love lifestyle. Next thing you know, boom, there's the gates of hell. Music is a powerful tool. I was laughing with Pastor Andy, and then we were talking about back in the day and stuff like that, and the, our music, and they're all listening, like listening to all these '80s songs. I'm like, I have no idea. I was like, this is it, and I pulled up a, a a drop from Pantera, where it's like breathe, spit, and walk, and I listen, to, and the the intro of this, it's like, come on now, just take the words out. Let me listen to the the music itself. And so, no, I don't go around and always do that. At least not on Wednesdays and Sundays. <laughs> but music is a powerful tool. There's a video series out there called Hell's Bells, The Danger of Rock and Roll. And it would go through. And this is when, like, Slipknot makes, like, the 60s and the 70s metal look like it's child's play. Like, people were, like, all, like, uh, you know, they're, like, all, like, <laughs> worried about, like, ACDC. I listen to ACDC, and I'm like, this is, like, a joke. This actually entertained people. It's like, get some real music up in here. You know, you got double bass beats and all this other stuff. And, yeah, so it has evolved. And it's a very powerful tool, not necessarily unless you're in concert live, stuck in a mosh pit. But just by, you could be in a dark room, laying on your bed on the couch, relaxing, and play music. And without even opening your eyes, your mind has went on a journey of the music writer, the songwriter. So much like with videos, whoever you're watching, that, that video, what, what is it called? Somebody that makes the videos. No, like, what is, like the actual, a producer, pro, yeah, producer. A producer, you're literally allowing that producer to have free rent in your mind while you watch that movie, Right? Same with anything else as far as entertainment, any video games you play. Music is, is, is all the same. I remember this. I, I literally despised it. Like, I'd have to go to work every day at construction specialties, and, like, the shop, they would play their music, and it was country music. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I wanted to go over there and either just, like, slip on some, like, death metal for them and just give them all a scare or something like that. But every day I heard, heard the song. And there was a song that was called Spanish is the Language of Love. I think that's what it's called. I'm terrible with music. I don't even know half the Christian songs. I just look at the lyrics on the wall and yell and scream. It says Spanish is the language of love, and I remember it was playing like nonstop, like three or four times a day. And, and basically what it was, this tired, weary traveler or something like that, I even forget, but he walks into a bar. Sister Carper of all things. He goes into a bar, and he sits up at the bar stool, and, and the next thing you know, the senorita down here serving margaritas looks at him, and he looks at her, and, and there's not one word spoken, but the next thing you know, they're on the dance floor, and the next thing you know, they're upstairs. Yeah. I don't know what she said. Okay, that's what it is. I don't know what she said. But what's what's the, what's the what's the next line of that? <laughs> it's 
Somebody's just passing out, my Lord. I, as she just said, I don't know what she said, but I sure like the way she said it. The gist of the song is this. Without a word spoken, he understood that she was available. Does that sound godly? In any music that takes me into a bar room, and now in my mind I'm thinking of this senorita, I remember sitting across the table with somebody that was, we were talking about worldly music. And I'm like, no, we do not listen to worldly music. If we're in a store and a beat drops and it's like an 80s beat and just knew it from all, like there's some, some people have a harder time because they're musically inclined. So as soon as a, a music plays, they're, they're into the beat, they hear it. Me, I'm like tone deaf. Like I won't hear it unless it's Pantera or somebody dropping like a death metal beat. And I'm like, oh, come on now. So some people have a harder time than others, okay? So we're, what I'm saying is this. I can't help what, what comes across the Ross Dress for Less store or Target, okay? But I can help with what I'm putting across my, my radio or music on a daily basis because just as the music has the ability or uh, videos have the ability to take your mind in directions that it shouldn't, so does the music you listen to. And, you know, here's the scoop. Here's why I bring up country music. Everybody knows, okay, it's probably not the best to go out there and, and, and you know, continually play Metallica and Slipknot and, and the, you know, the Lamb of God and all these other hardcore, decrepit birth rock bands. Everybody's like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. But people are okay with listening to country music, and I don't get it. Because your mind goes on the same central, sexual idea and thought process that it does when you're watching a PG-13 or an R movie. You understand? You're allowing entertainment to take your mind into a sinful thought process, uh, into a sinful lifestyle. And I know what it was like. When I was them three years where I wasn't necessarily living for God, I would listen to music. Even though I never went to the strip club, guess what? I went there a thousand times in my mind because I listened to rap music. Even though I never did drugs, I, in my mind, I, I, I was in that lifestyle. I was in that worldly, that frame of mind. Even though I never went out there and, like, jumped into a mosh pit, I could see it in my mind. And so people live these fictitious lives via sinful entertainment with the music they listen to, and they escape reality because of the ability via music. Music is designed to tell a story. We were sitting across at that table, and we were arguing. Like, I'm, I'm not backing down on this. this was, these were friends, so I'm not going to sugarcoat this. It's not, and I'm, I'm debating. No, it's not right. It's not right to do that, to infiltrate your mind with that on a daily, constant basis. And I'm getting there, and I'm getting heated up, and Jess is under the table kicking me. like, <laughs> I'm not backing down. So we get into the car. We get into the car, and they turn on the radio, and they turn it to country music. And the first song, I'll never forget it, it was a fast, upbeat, and she begins to dance. And, and guess what? When the first words came across, I'm in the honky-tonk barroom dancing and shagging with other women and all this other stuff. And she said, oh, that's not a good song. Let's just hold on. The next song comes in, and now I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm running from this. I, I brought my date home late, and this father that's mad because I brought my, home, uh, my date home late is all upset, and all this confusion, all all of this stuff is going on, and I'm like, oh, okay, is that the one? And then, and then it's like, well, there's a good song. It's called, called God in Me because they throw God into a song, and all of a sudden it's good. I said, listen, I'm not going to dig through the bones to find one little scrap of meat. I'm not going to sit there and allow my mind to go down that road just so I can hear one song from a country writer that was written about God. If I want to hear a song about God, I'll go to WGRC or somewhere else. I'll go to uh, what, 
Spotify and I'll create my own prayer list, prayer music list. You understand? So music is a very powerful tool. I would suggest this as your pastor here, not to listen to worldly music. I'm not saying that if, if you and your wife are reminiscing or you and, you and you know, uh, just Anita and Jen are laughing, they heard a song, that rem, re, they reminisced back when they were partying and, and, you know, all that stuff and having fun and their favorite band was the Spice Girls. <laughs> I'm not saying if they're laughing about it and they pull up a song and they listen to it and they laughed about laughed about it. I'm not saying that that's that's wrong. What I'm saying is this: this constant infiltration of worldliness into your mind is not conducive to your godly calling, your godly lifestyle, the way that God has called you to live. Amen. It's not. So just because I can doesn't mean that I should doesn't mean that I should. So I'll move on. I can't believe I ever thought of Spice Girls. That really dates us, doesn't it? So as Christians, we ask ourselves, what is this music promoting? I think it was my dad or somebody else. And I know my dad referenced it. But he said country music is Christian music in reverse. I'm going to mess it up and everything else says it. Yeah, how am I going to say it? Because with Christian music, my dog comes back, my wife comes back to me, and something else, he keeps keeps his house or his truck. Are these words pushing me closer to God? What lifestyle is the music singing about? See, you might think, oh, I'm being hard-nosed. I'm not. I've had to give up a lot to be where I'm at. I've had to walk away from friends, forsake my life, forsake my dreams, forsake Wyoming. (laughs) Listen, there's nothing more important to me than my walk with God. So if you're here or you're listening or you're going to be listening at some point in time and Jesus isn't literally everything to you, then this might not make sense. But there's no way that I'm going to get up in the morning, pray the Lord's Prayer, Lord, deliver me from evil, help me today to walk with you, to be pleasing to you, and then get in my car on the, on the ride to work and start playing worldly music that sings about the lifestyle that he doesn't want me to be living. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I would highly suggest, and I would say it loud and clear, that the music that you should be listening to is Christian music, music that edifies your walk with God, music that builds up your walk with God. Music connects our emotions with an idea or even a lifestyle. By listening to music, a person has the ability to connect to whatever the song is being sung about. And even though some of us would never think about going out and doing drugs or anything like that, when we listen to music, we find our minds going down that same thought process, that same pathway. We ask ourselves this, and I'm going to draw this to a close here in the next 10 minutes. We ask ourselves this question, since all music is not sinful, where does the Christian draw the line at? I say this, much like movies, TVs, and everything else that we do on the eye gate, we apply the same principles here. There has to be at some point in time where we say, I am not crossing this threshold for entertainment. Here are a few uh, genres that people listen to, rock music, and I, I've covered this briefly as I got ahead of myself thinking about the old days and Jen rocking out the Spice Girls. Rock music has the, in it, the ability to inspire evil, not just by the words but by the music itself. Rock music is designed to increase tension, stress, disorientation, and the loss of self-control. Uh, it, it, have you ever heard of a mosh pit? Have you ever heard of the wall of death? No. Basically, when you got thousands of people in a concert, uh, they, they will separate 
the concert in half, and literally you'll watch as, as they create like a 50-foot big square, and you got people on all sides, the rock music's playing, and, and as soon as the singer gives the cue, all sides, both sides, everybody runs into the middle, and they start swinging and start mosh pitting, and, and it, it gets wild. And that's what the rock has the ability to do, bring out the wild side in you. How many could go and do a little mosh pit? Nobody. Okay, that's good. Just checking your spiritual radar. <laughs> Michelle's like, well, after a long day of work, there's times where I want to mosh pit. <laughs> Here, okay, here's the golden nugget. Are you ready? Let this define the parameters, excuse me, of the music that you listen to. This is a huge indi indicator of the music style and the effect that it has. Just watch the people who attend the concert of whatever said genre you're listening to. Rave and techno music, even though they're all, there isn't always words, just watch the effects that it has at rave concerts. Viewer discretion advised. Country music mostly dwells on unho unwholesome themes such as adultery, fornication, divorce, <laughs> drinking, partying, honky tonks, checking people for ticks, calling tractor sexy. Country music is centered around dancing, and the dancing is generally sexually attractive to the opposite sex. Am I wrong? Where do we draw the line as somebody that wants to please God? Stop laughing, Barb. You're going to make me laugh. Where do we draw the line as Christians trying to pursue God in all manner of holiness when it comes to the music that we listen to? Is it safe to say just as unwholesome and hypocritical as it is for Christians to indulge in movies that are like PG-13 and rated R? It would be just as hypocritical to indulge in a lifestyle of worldly music that takes you down the same path. Since some of you, it's unfortunate because you're stuck in a workplace that literally will play music like country music where I wanted to, there's a rock song that basically says he wanted to put his finger in his eye, and every day listening to country music, that's a how I felt <laughs> listening to country music. So some of you can't help it. But again, what is the principle of entertainment? I can't help always what happens out there, but I can help what I do and what I allow into my own house or to my car radio. And so... I will close with this, maybe. In the form of all entertainment, TV shows, streaming services, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, books, magazines, podcasts, audiobooks, music, all of these have the same fundamental principles of holiness that governs, governs them. What effect do they have on my walk with God? Are they promoting a lifestyle that I just won't live? That's contrary to the word of God. You can ask that question to some people and in order to justify their fleshly desires, they will say that it just does not affect them. But to the contrary, a soldier commission does not entangle himself with the affairs of this world, but he's focused. He's zoned in to what God's purpose is for his life. And I would say this, that those that struggle with worldly entertainment you don't have a clear vision of what God has for your life. You don't have a clear purpose and a direction in your life. Because if you had a clear purpose and a direction, just like every marathon runner has an end goal in mind, therefore that end, good, end goal excuse me, determines what they do and how they live their life. If we as Christians had the end goal of what God wanted to do in our life and through us, we wouldn't be entangling ourselves with sinful worldly entertainment. So I would put a plug in there. If you're struggling with your purpose, your godly purpose, then seek God. And he said, when you seek, for, seek after me with all your heart, you will find me. 
Seek them. Put up entertainment for a while. Pick up your Bible. I know somebody has come to me uh, after some challenges by God and also me, came to me and said, you know what, I'm, I'm redoing my lifestyle, getting up at 430 every morning, reading my Bible. I'm focused on, on you know, going further in my, my walk with God. And the first two and a half hours of their day is centered around a good, godly lifestyle, making changes. You do stuff like that, guess what? You get God's attention. It's as simple as that. You draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to you. I speak to ministry, ministry-minded people. I don't know one, one minister such as Lee Stone King, David Bernard, men like this that are mightily used that just indulge themselves in sinful entertainment. Matter of fact, rarely probably even entertainment themselves. I'm not saying that they don't, but I'm saying they're driven by a godly purpose, a godly passion. And so where do we draw the line at? Again, holiness in music, holiness in the things that we are listening to. And again, holiness to one person, it can be your freedom. It can be the open door to God using you like he's never used you before. And holiness to another person is nothing more than a bunch of legalism and bondage. You know why? It, it's all about the relationship. It's all about the relationship. When, when, when Jesus asked me for something, it's never done out of legalism. It's done out of love. And I think he's very concerned about what I consistently listen to. Amen. Music again. The prophet, when he wanted to hear from God, he said, bring me the minstrels and play me play music. Music can literally thrust you into the presence of God just like that. Amen. Music is a powerful tool. And I, I ask you, I ask you to consider this. And I'm not accusing. I don't know what you listen to. Don't tell me what you listen to. I'm not trying to micromanage anybody. I'm not. But I would just highly suggest one more time before I close this. This session out is if you have a habit of continually listening to worldly music, music that's not Christian, music that's not edifying your walk with God, I would say this. I would say ditch that music. Make a commitment to God. I'm not going to defile my mind with these worldly lifestyles, these worldly songs, and I'm going to make a commitment to get as close to you as I can and watch and see if God does not honor that. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Please, please, please remember uh, brother and sister Wise and sister Jane. I did mention Sunday that I was, uh, Jess and I, we have an anniversary trip that was already planned months ago. Um, that is on hold right now, and uh, I'm getting people for backup in case we decide to go. I just, I'm praying about it and just, you know, um, want to make sure that, that we make the right decision in that. And so um, if, if you guys come and I'm here this Sunday, I'm still going to have some ministers help me out in preaching. Um, and if I'm not, know this, that me and my wife are celebrating our 19-year anniversary a few months late. And uh, I appreciate, appreciate you guys understanding that. But I love you. I appreciate you. God bless you.